there was a really big fire in 1916, January the 1st, 1916, that uh, just uh, south of the bridge, uh, all those buildings on both sides were livery stables and stores. And, and legend has it, or you read in some of the accounts that somebody's lan a lantern turned over or something in somebody's barn or something and then set it on fire. Motor vehicle crash. Nope. That comes orange. All right, there's a pager. Okay, so yeah. It's hard to believe that we're the first fire company in the county. Uh, we're proud of it, very proud. It makes me, it makes me feel proud. Uh, I, I'm just thankful I'm, that I'm a part of this, this organization. We have worked diligently since the beginning of time, since 1916, so that we have the, the firehouse that we have, the, the equipment that we have, not just apparatus, but the equipment that we need to go do our jobs comes from back then, they knew how to raise money, how to invest money, how to save money. We were like brothers here, and we still are like brothers. Uh, it's, it's uh, anytime you have a, uh, to work close as we do in a life-threatening situation day in and day out in training, I think that you uh, have, you, you are in trust with each other. Any sort of emergency that uh, that people need help. And the whole fire company has thrived because of people who were part of the community, whether it was businesses or whatever, and if a fire company needed something, they provided it. Come from the heart, and you want to give back to the community.
It may have been a lantern, or an oil lamp, or a candle left unattended by New Year's Eve revelers. We'll never know for sure. But at 1 o'clock in the morning on January 1, 1916, fire broke out in the T. Mass & Company confectionery shop, located on the west side of Main Street, Gordonsville, Virginia, just south of the railroad overpass. The blaze spread quickly. Most of the structures were made of wood. Villagers sounded the alarm. A YMCA team from the University of Virginia, who just happened to be in the area, manned a hose reel and connected it to a hydrant that produced a meager flow from the reservoir on Cameron's Mountain. It took them a half hour to find a nozzle they could attach to the hose. The fire jumped Main Street to the east side. A building was dynamited to stop the blaze to no avail. The night operator at the Chesapeake and Potomac Telephone Company had to abandon her post because of the flames, but only after she sent pleas for help to Orange and Charlottesville. Charlottesville responded by loading a steam pumper on board a flat car and hooking it to a C&O locomotive and arriving on scene in 18 minutes. They connected the pumper to the water storage tank at the train station and by dawn had gotten the fire under control. When the smoke had cleared, 15 businesses and six residences lay in ashes. The loss was estimated at $60,000. That's $1.3 million in today's money. At the time, only 10000 of it was insured. Two days later, Mayor J.L.T. Sneed wrote a letter of thanks to the mayor of Charlottesville, who responded immediately. That same day, the Gordonsville Town Council resolved to donate $100 to the Charlottesville Fire Department. Three months later, on April 1, 1916, the Gordonsville Volunteer Fire Company came into being with the purchase of its first pumper, marking the birth of an ongoing tradition of volunteerism, fiscal responsibility, and community service that thrives to this day. The first fire chief was Dr. R. M. Spencer, he was only able to serve for two years. Leslie Merrick Acree took over in 1918 and served as chief for an astounding 43 years. The pumper was housed in a small building near where the town shop is today. It would be put to good use four years later when another devastating fire took out the south side of Gordonsville, all the way to today's town hall. In that blaze, the pumper worked for 10 hours straight, with two men continuously replenishing the pumper's engine with gasoline and oil. In 1923, the auxiliary was organized, with the objective of raising enough money to build a new firehouse, thereby creating another strong, ongoing tradition in the Gordonsville Volunteer Fire Company. This was the beginning of the parade, the carnival, the banquet. In those days, each member of the auxiliary had to pay a dollar per year dues. Its 157 members raised $4,424.68, enough to build the firehouse on Main Street. The company also managed to buy some more equipment. When George Cower joined in 1926, he said this truck was a white which had replaced the original Model T of 1916. In the late 1920s, the company procured the La France, which to this day makes an annual appearance at the parade. During the 1930s, the auxiliary continued to raise money. At a banquet fundraiser, one of the town's wealthiest ladies, Mrs. Flores Inn, contributed $10, which was quite a lot of money in those days. Others contributed food, coffee, bread, potatoes, peas, hams, and hens. A news story from the 1930s reports that L. M. Acre was re-elected chief, and in that role he made numerous assignments for hose men, plug men, and truck connection men. Among those assignments are some familiar Gordonsville names. Preddy, Omohundro, 
pain, tally, slaughter, just to name a few. And in those days, to be a fireman, you had to pay monthly dues. Average number of fire calls per year? 30. It's also interesting to note that in 1930, Charles Oots of Barbersville applied for membership. The Gordonsville Volunteer Fire Company entered the 1940s as a vibrant community organization, despite the fact that World War II drained some of its manpower. To fill the gap, teenagers too young to go to war were recruited. Linwood L. Woody Coiner, who served as chief for 21 years, was one of those young men. In 1943, the company siren doubled as an air raid alarm. In 45, Joe Preddy approached the rationing board over the issue of gasoline used by firemen in their personal vehicles while responding to fire calls. And because of gasoline rationing, the company traveled to a parade in Orange by horse-drawn hay wagon. Some people say they had trouble with keeping people on and coming back. But... <laughs> I wasn't there. <laughs> Throughout the decades, the Gordonsville Volunteer Fire Company built another ongoing tradition, that of making wise business investments, particularly in real estate. In 1946, the company purchased the Memorial Hall building on Main Street. In 1947, it purchased the Sidlinger lot in town. In 1948, they extended the firehouse 24 additional feet. Garnet Taylor joined the Gordonsville Volunteer Fire Company in 1956, but he well remembers a fire that he witnessed in the 1940s. It was a two-story home, and I remember seeing out of the, my bedroom window the flames and smoke and all from that fire. A brush fire in 1954 was actually caught on 8mm movie film. In those days, it seemed proper etiquette required that you wear a coat and tie to a brush fire. It wasn't all business. They took time to have some fun, too. In the summertime, when it was warm and all, uh, you go to a fire like a field fire or any kind of fire, you know. Uh, when it was over with, you know, it was over with, and before you stopped the pumps, maybe, you, know, you, you had to look around and see where Skippy was, because if he had to hose, somebody was going to get wet. I think guys garden or something had burned and said, well, I got the fire all put out. And uh, Skippy stuck a nozzle up in the air and it came on over and it just sprinkled all down <laughs> over him. And, and the man's wife come to the door and started out the door of the house and he said, woman, don't come over here. He said, it's pouring down rain. <laughs> From the earliest days, Gordonsville firemen liked to play baseball. And then there's the story of the 1939 GMC cab over truck. It was a beauty. And even after it had served many years as a fire truck, it continued on as a party and parade vehicle. We'd ride that thing over to, we'd go over in the valley almost every week. Parades. Harrisonburg, Timberville, you know, all of those uh, places over had parades. We'd go over there. And that truck, it would have people inside, people laying up on top, people hanging on the back. They had a lot of fun. And, and, and never, you know, even though, you know, there was drinking and carrying on, nobody ever really got in trouble or got hurt or anything, you know. 
The truck was eventually sold to Lake of the Woods and later wound up in a junkyard, first in Madison County, then down near Roanoke, until it caught the eye of Virginia Beach dentist Dr. Mike Denbar. Denbar has a passion for restoring old fire trucks, and he's restoring this one to its former grandeur. As he was digging around in the vehicle, he found, among other things, devices under the seats for opening beer cans and a ceramic tile floor for uh, easy hosing down. Word around the fire hall is that if this truck could talk, they'd have to kill it. I actually got in trouble because uh, uh, I started going to fires before I got voted in. One of the first ones was Piedmont Metal Fabricators right up here off of Main Street. And then we left there and went to Calvin's Turkey Farm for a turkey host fire, both in the same day. And I wasn't even voted in yet, so they had to slow me up a little bit, and then uh, I got voted in. <laughs> the story of the Gordonsville Volunteer Fire Company from the 1960s to the present comes to life through the memories of several veteran firefighters. Roy Childs is one. Randy Preddy is another. I used to go to fires with my dad. He was a fireman uh, years for years and years before I was uh, able to join. I used to go to fires, and, and he made me sit in the car, and he just always it, it excited me, and I just couldn't wait to become of age to become a fireman. It got in my blood, and... Both of my uncles uh, belong to the Golden to Fire Company. Uh, one of them still does, and now my son does. We didn't have a lot of things to do here in town, and um, I just love fighting the fire. Because he lived close to the firehouse, Roy Childs would respond to calls on his bicycle. Well, I had a paper route, so I had a basket on the front, and I just put a light in the basket on the front. <laughs> One of Child's earliest memories was being let out of high school to help fight a forest fire near the county landfill. Yeah, that started at the Orange Landfill, and they came across uh, Kendall Road, and they finally stopped it uh, over on the other side of Kendall Road. But the, the guys were in front of the fire with hoses down, and the wind came through, and the fire went around the truck, over the truck, and it kept on going. <laughs> they didn't stop it. And because there was virtually no turnout gear, Showing up to a fire in a coat and tie was commonplace. I could pull my tie off coming down the road to get the fire, but I, I ruined many a white shirt. At that time, when you, when you went to the fire, you, we had some coats, we had some helmets, and we had some boots. It might fit you and it might not. Most of the time when you ended up fighting fire at, 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 in 1971 was uh, you fought in what the clothes you had on. If we had some old hip boots and we had some old leather coats and some hard plastic helmets. And uh, we had the long boots like fishermen use, you know, that you fold out. And uh, we had a compartment in the fire truck and we hung all the coats in there. And come spring, they decided they were too hot so they took the liners out of them. Then, uh, so they wouldn't be so hot in the summertime. And then when fall came, they tried to put the liners back, and at that time, everything was custom-made, and only the liner that came out of one coat would fit in that same coat, so the liners never really got back into the coat. And just calling in a fire and rounding up responders was a complicated procedure. The emergency number was five twos, 22222, two, 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 okay? And it went into the CNO switch towel, and whoever was working at the switch tower took the call and set the siren off. And the first one that got to the fire hose, the phone would be ringing. And it was the switch tower calling the fire hose to tell us where it was. And whoever took that call, there was a chalkboard there, and you wrote the information on the chalkboard for everybody else to see. Yeah, we lived at the circle, so all I had to do was ride down Main Street all the way down the hill. It was downhill all the way. So when we got to the firehouse, the driver would get in, he pretty much would pull off, and we would grab our turnout gear. And if you're lucky, you could get it on before he pulled off, but if not, you would, you would grab it, and you would run and jump on back to the fire truck. We, we would run and catch that truck halfway between the firehouse and the, and the underpass. 
And we were all used to jumping up on it with just T-shirts and shorts or whatever we came, up, came with. Well, on that particular day, uh, it hadn't been too long got that new turnout gear, and I tried to make a run for it like I was doing without turnout gear, and with that gear, I couldn't move as fast. And I got one foot on the tailboard, and a firefighter that was already on the tailboard, he had me by the shoulder trying to pull me on. I was trying to tell him to let me loose because I could tell I couldn't get on. And needless to say, when he let go, I went down and I did a barrel roll right down Main Street. There were a lot of things that happened. You know, we lost shoes and hats and our clothing while we were changing clothes going down the highway. I drove a truck, gosh, almost 80 miles an hour to a truck with seven people on the back. And when I got to the fire, I found that the, the fire was uh, not as big as the truck. And I'm like, I really need to rethink this. <laughs> Over the past 50 years, there have been some memorable fires. The gas plant in the 1960s. I guess that was something to see, but, you know, no one got hurt and nothing blew up. Uh, the, uh, the building was full of the, uh, the tanks that, that they had in that day, and, but each one of them had a, a blowout valve in it, you know, safety valves in them. So if they reached a certain temperature, a certain pressure, you would blow that valve and then the gas would blow out like a torch. And it burned furiously, but it didn't blow up. And, and I think I was told that there was over 100 of those uh, tanks in that building and every one of them, the safety valves, did what they were supposed to. A fire at Christ Episcopal Church in 1970 shot flames out of the roof 15 feet high. Two of the biggest fires in company history occurred within one month of each other. Inverness and Hawkwood. On December 29, 1981, Garnet Taylor was coming home from work when he noticed flames coming out of the hilltop mansion known as Inverness. He got my equipment and I went up there. And uh, short story is the next morning I was still up there and uh, I came down about six o'clock, came home, ate breakfast, and went back to work. But it, went up, it was like a box house, three-story box house, and the fire went up the back wall and went into the attic. Yeah, and like so many of those big homes, uh, in the, it, where the staircase went up, it was like three stories. And uh, I'll never forget, it was right before Christmas, it had a Christmas tree in the middle of the hallway. Must have been 30 feet tall or more. And that didn't get you on fire. And uh, that Christmas tree was, was lit, and we fought fire, and it never went out. We had neighboring fire companies coming in I, from Barbersville and Orange. I think uh, Greene County was there. Uh, we shuttled a lot of water, but I, where I was uh, pr particularly positioned, I was at a swimming pool that had 24,000 gallons of water, and I had to get water out of that, and so we hooked up pump, uh, billy pumps and everything to, to supply me, and we pumped it completely dry. And, and like I said, it was, it was very enjoyable to me because I got to learn and hands-on what firefighting was about with, from the end of pumping water and making sure everybody had water. And then, a month later, in deep snow, Hawkwood in the Green Springs area caught fire. Hawkwood was a, a, an estate home that was, had walls, you know, like two foot thick. It burned and burned, and it just wouldn't go out. And it just, it, we just were there in the middle of the night, had about uh, 18 inches of snow on the ground. And we were there all night and saw the sun come up, and probably uh, lasted about 10, 12 hours. Yeah, now Mrs. Uh, Fisher brought us uh, some soup up there that day, that morning. A great big pot of, of homemade vegetable soup. And of course, you know, we got the fire came in about two o'clock, and it was cold and snow on the ground. And uh, she probably brought that about ten o'clock, and we were both starved. <laughs> we, nailed, we nailed that pot of soup. More recent fires include the restaurant Palm in 2006 and Colonial Florist in 2008, likely hit by lightning. Some fires result in happy endings, like this little fellow who survived a house fire thanks to some kind-hearted firemen. And there have been some unusual calls. Uh, probably years ago, we probably got uh, cats out of trees, but I never did. <laughs> 
one call like that, I think it was last year or a couple of years ago, we had a horse that had gotten, had uh, walked over and walked on the uh, covering in the wintertime, had walked over the covering and it fell through into a uh, swimming pool. It was a matter of getting the pool drained and so we could get the horse out of it, the horse was not injured. Fire Chief Ronnie Johnson remembers a similar rescue to this lucky dog. So we'd been there like 30 or 40 minutes. Um, had the fire knocked down, they were pulling ceilings. So I told the guys to go back in and see if they could find the dog. So when they went inside, someone turned to the right, and next thing you know, they seen something moving in the corner, and the dog was in there. Uh, I was very surprised that uh, he was not deceased. Um, brought him out there, they cleaned him up a little bit. Uh, medic unit gave him a little bit of oxygen, he was fine. Fortunately, there have been no fatalities or serious injuries among members of the Gordonsville Volunteer Fire Company while fighting a fire. But there have been some close calls. Randy Pretty and Mike Beasley will never forget the day they responded to a blaze in the attic of a garage on Cameron's Mountain. And we got to a door which went into that attic of that garage. And I know that um, there was a lot of smoke in there. We had a charge line and I was on the nozzle. And I uh, said, so we're going to get ready to open this door. And I uh, said, I'm going to open it up. And I said, open the door. And we were all down on our knees and close to the ground. We opened that door. It just flew back. And all I could see was orange. It was just like the sun jumped out at us. And uh, it was a uh, backflash. And, uh, well, when I got up there with a mask on, I said, it's too hot in here. By that time, one of the other firemen opened the door and it flashed. Well, it caught me right in the edge of the door, knocked me about five feet out into a hallway. And it, I mean, it never didn't hurt anybody, but the shields on the, on the, uh, the uh, helmets, some of them were melted. It, it knocked me down, but I had the nozzle on, uh, uh, a fog pattern, and I took it to that door, and I just kept whipping around like we were trained to do, and I feel like that um, uh, it kind of kept it from spreading. All you see is yellow fire, and, and it's scary a little bit, yeah. Matter of fact, I, didn't go, I haven't been in the house since then. And most, if not all, members of the fire company have had to deal with fires and automobile accidents resulting in death. The worst involved children. Yeah, we remember uh, the fire at uh, Madison Run where a five-year-old burn up in the, in, in the house and his father was out in the yard. His eyelids were melted off where he'd been in there trying to get him out. There's a lot of them that come back to you uh, because, you know, in this business, uh, when you're working, you don't pay attention a whole lot to what you see. But after the fact, you can have flashbacks, you can remember things. And uh, one of the worst, because it involved children, was a barn that burnt down. It was a, a barn full of round hay bales and it was down on Route 22 in Louisa County. And when we got on scene, it was, everything was fully involved. And the woman was screaming that her kids were out there, possibly in the barn. And once we got the fire knocked down and everything, uh, Randy Pretty and I actually found them, two little boys, face down, and nothing but skeleton, you know. and. Uh, Things like that, you know, it rem you remember, it never leaves you. We are exposed to that on a daily basis, and uh, I just hope people don't let it get them down and, uh, can, and keep positive, because we do see the worst that uh, life has to offer uh, on a regular basis, <clears throat> and sometimes the best, absolutely. It was, it was just, you know, go to the fire and put the water on it, and that, that's basically it. My first uh, training, formal type training, was a course called uh, General Firemanship. I still have the patch. We had training. We had uh, a, a gentleman that came out of Richmond. He was the first state uh, fire trainer, and he actually came here in and, and Orange. And uh, we trained together with Orange, and he 
gosh, the first fog nozzle we ever saw he had in the back of his car. Needless to say, training requirements have grown exponentially since the early days. Training is going to be a key thing. It's having a minimum training standard for just about everybody because yellow helmets, their minimum training standard is taking Firefighter 1 and Hazmat Ops. That's roughly about 200 hours. The training I received here allowed me to operate a business and I didn't go to college. It was just amazing. You know, Ten years of chief engineer, I learned to maintain a fleet of vehicles. Uh, chairman of the Carnival Committee, gosh, if you can handle the first two hours of that, you can handle any business on a busy morning. <laughs> so the, the training that I received here, both hazardous materials, you name it, uh, has been just fabulous as far as helping me through life. And needless to say, the equipment to fight fires has grown in sophistication as well. This is a far cry from fishing boots and vinyl coats. In this photo, dated 1966, Woody Coiner is squatting next to what may be the company's first air pack. Compare that with the gear of today. It's state of the art. When they come out of the truck, they're fully suited up with all full gear, all air packs, with radios, everything is set to go. And all the equipment now, the face masks for the air are. Uh, air packs, they're, they're face fitted for everybody. Everybody has their own mask. They're not somebody uses this one, somebody uses that one. They're fitted for it and they have, their, like I said, they have their own mask. But this state of the art equipment comes at great cost. Uh, just, just the coat and pants uh, uh, run about $1,700 a piece. The helmet is probably two or three hundred. The boots are a couple of hundred dollars. So that's just for one person. We've probably roughly spent about $2,200, $2,300 per member. That set of gear, boots, pants, coat, gloves, no max hood, and a helmet, in 10 years had to be replaced. Even more expensive is a new fire truck. This newest engine, featuring a unique paint scheme, cost in excess of a half million dollars. It's custom built. Everything on there has its own price tag. Wow. Lights, lights are expensive, all LEDs, but just every little thing has a price. Still, the fire company has maintained a tradition of fiscal responsibility, a tradition rooted by its founding fathers. I think we have done a very good job on building this piece of apparatus that we can get 20, 25 years out of easily. Since I've been in, been in here, and, and it's my motto, we don't buy it unless we have the money to pay for it. And that goes true in, for the firehouse. That was paid for when we moved in here, it was paid for. Even the way you fought a fire has changed. Roy Childs tells a story about Jimmy Preddy. That was back in the days when we didn't have Turner gear and they didn't use air packs. And he'd have an old cigar in his mouth and uh, get close to the nozzle because some oxygen would come through it and they could knock out more fire than anybody I've ever seen. In fact, there was a host right over here in the back side of the fairgrounds. And uh, I was a junior fireman, but I was on the porch with a hose squirting water in the window. And Jimmy came up and said, come on, let's go. And I said, Jimmy, I can't, I'm a junior. He said, get out the way. <laughs> you always want to walk on what you want to save. If the fire's in the back of the house, you go in the front and put everything good behind you and, and push the fire out the bad area. And the fire's in the front of the house, you go in the back and walk on what you want to save and push the fire out. And I think that's probably the most uh, knowledgeable thing that I learned, and I've been to a lot of schools, and, uh, and I keep seeing that. You just you know, walk on what you want to save. The very nature of calls for help have changed over the years. In the 1930s, the fire department responded primarily to structure and brush fires. Years ago, like at a house fire, you had pine wood and cotton, and now you've got all these plastics that, that give off all these uh, bad gases. During the 1970s and 80s, people went back to heating with wood stoves, resulting in more chimney fires. Because a lot of the older homes didn't have liners in their chimneys. And over the years, the mortar would fall out. And uh, so they get all that, all that, uh, tar and everything up inside the chimney and it catches on fire and it would, you know, would, fire would lick out where the mortar was gone in the bricks and 
find some piece of wood or something to catch on to. And Back in 1991, Gordonsville became the first company in Orange County to respond to automobile accidents. Uh, yes, I guess we saw the need in that, uh, you know, the rescue squad's crash truck was in Orange, and uh, we were working out in here in Louisa County and eating out in our mall back towards Bobbinsville and all. And it take them so long to get there that, uh, that we thought it was good to be able to have something right on the spot. By 1993, the company had a squad truck carrying extrication gear. And today, many company members are also first responders. We have what's called a, a matro. Have all kinds of cutters, spreaders. If their car's wrapped around a person, we can completely cut every bit of it away from them and get them out of, out of that situation. Back in the 1930s, the fire company responded to 30 calls per year. That number is closer to 450 today. Probably the most common calls today, <laughs> unfortunately, is these alarm systems. Yeah. They're alarms, but they're alarms that, that, that really doesn't amount to anything. And I'm not sure how we tackle that, but... You have to answer them because you don't know when it's going to be the real thing. I can remember we had a, a water flow alarm at the lace factory one night, and as we went around the circle, we could see fire coming through the roof. It happens. That sometimes it's a real deal, but you've got to take each one of them as if it's, uh, it's going to be a real fire. It's, well, especially if you're a volunteer, you got, you've got a full-time job, and, you, know, and, then you, and you, you want to donate your time, but if it's just day in and constant, you know, day in and day out, you can't you can't do that very long. It it gets it, it gets to where you get like again you get frustrated. I can, you know I'm tired. I can't do this. You know, we have members that are very frustrated at times. One of the biggest changes in firefighting is in communications. We've come a long way from having a switchboard operator turn on the siren and wait for someone to answer the phone at the firehouse. If you have a smartphone, there's a number that's pre-programmed into your phone. Once you hit it, we have a screen in the fire station that um, their name pops up there. The I Am Responding screen lists who and how many are responding to the call and when they'll arrive at the firehouse. That's what the technology is now, and we're probably only hitting the tip of the iceberg on the way that we can utilize this tool that we have. Over the years, fire companies in Orange and Louisa counties have worked out a mutual aid agreement with Gordonsville. We have as big a first due area in Louisa as most of the um, fire companies in Louisa. So we rely on each other, not just in our own organization, but with other organizations. Orange County, we have an automatic aid agreement amongst the five fire companies that we have in Orange County. So if we have a working fire, it's an automatic three company response. The role of a fire chief has also seen change, just like everything else. I've enjoyed that and hoping that we have uh, moved forward um, from what we, the way we used to do things to the way we're having to do things now and the way we're going to have to continue to do because the fire service is ever evolving to uh, the way we do business. There is so much responsibility uh, everyone has to be accountable for what they do. Um, that's where, like I said, where it goes back into the training. I have the same authority as a chief being paid uh, throughout the state of Virginia. Their same responsibilities. Anything that can go wrong, or if it does go wrong, they can put me in jail just as fast as they can put a career chief in jail. It is remarkable that in its 100-year history, the Gordonsville Volunteer Fire Company has had a total of only eight chiefs. Two of them in particular deserve special attention because they combined for 64 years of service wearing the chief's helmet. Linwood Merrick Acri was a founding member of the Gordonsville Volunteer Fire Company. You might say he was motivated because his grocery store burned down in the 1916 fire. He rebuilt it and took over as fire chief in 1919, a position he would hold for 43 years. His wife ran an antique business. He also served two terms as mayor of the town, once in the 1930s 
and again in the 1950s. The other chief deserving special attention is Linwood L. Coiner. Although he was officially a member of the fire company for 60 years, Woody actually had almost 70 years experience fighting fires. He was one of the teenagers recruited to fill the manpower gap during World War II. Woody served a total of 21 years as the company's chief. From the latter part of the 20th century and into the 21st, the Gordonsville Volunteer Fire Company continued to grow while maintaining its time-honored traditions of community service and fiscal responsibility. Milestones along that journey would include the purchase of new apparatus and equipment to better serve changing needs. One of the biggest milestones in its history was the decision in 1983 to build a new firehouse. The new firehouse had been operating for about a dozen years when on June 12, 1997, someone left a hatch door open on the squad truck. As the truck left the building, the hatch door clipped a support post and part of the roof caved in. Two fire trucks sustained major damage, but luckily there were no injuries. It wasn't long before the roof was repaired, the support post strengthened, and the firehouse was up and running again. In 2001, the nation suffered a roof collapse of its own on September 11th. Right after 9-11, uh, it was the Saturday after that happened, a uh, bunch of us got together and said, hey, we want to do a boot drive and see if we can raise some money for the, for the uh, fallen firemen's families. Well, we started at like, I think it was 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning. We was out there with the boots and all this stuff on the circle, and we were trying to get some money. Well, next thing you know, we had money running everywhere. We come back to the firehouse and counted it, and it was right at $10,000 that we collected. That is a, uh, one of the I-beams from one of the uh, Twin Towers from New York. We acquired that in 2011. One of the restrictions was it had to be outside, and it had to be uh, so the public could, could see it uh, each and every day. Uh, and and we, uh, we've put a plaque on it, and it's, we, we're kind of proud of it. On this 100th anniversary, the Gordonsville Volunteer Fire Company honors its own fallen. The tradition of the annual parade dates back to the 1920s. Over the years, the parade grew in stature. The 1970 parade with 6,000 people was declared the biggest yet, until the next year. They gave away a car every year. Dinks Avery would sell 18 to 20 books of tickets. If you were running for office in the state of Virginia, 
the Gordonsville Volunteer Firemen's Parade was a must-attend political event. Gradually, as other forms of entertainment competed for attention, the parade waned. But uh, Gordonsville Parade, when I was a kid, I mean, it, people came from miles over. Uh, they were four and five deep on the street from one end to the other. Uh, this past year, it was very thin. We still have nice parades, but the amount of people on the street is just a fractional. <laughs> The same thing happened with the carnival. In the old days, the week-long event was the only game in town. In 2005, the carnival was closed down by town authorities for violating state gambling law. Uh, it happened the night before the carnival was supposed to open. Um, I have no ill feelings. Uh, I know that the uh, chief of police had a job to do, but it was just the way he went about doing it. We checked into it. Um, he was correct. The carnival came back, but with distractions like King's Dominion, the internet, video games, and the smartphone, its future is uncertain. It just doesn't seem like the crowd is there that used to be. So next year will be our last year with uh, the ride company that we have. Uh, we're going to look at some different avenues, whether or not we might do a one-day event and see how many people would show up. It would lessen the load a little bit, but yet you're still doing something for the community. One of the biggest challenges for any volunteer organization is money. How to raise enough of it to cover the skyrocketing costs of a modern-day fire company. Right from the beginning, the Auxiliary has played a pivotal role in the growth and development of the Gordonsville Volunteer Fire Company. Every year at the annual banquet, the Auxiliary has presented the fire chief with a check. And every year, it's for more and more money. I'd like to present you with this check. Must be our 75th anniversary. <laughs> Last year, they presented us a check with $40,000. You know, that really helped. So what is the future of the Gordonsville Volunteer Fire Company? The operative word here is volunteer. Although county government participation is on the increase, volunteers will still be the core of the company. Fire companies still have to raise a certain amount of money because I have to look out for the taxpayers. I think that's a lot to absorb. Um, you take five fire companies and each one of them got a $600,000 fire truck. And in this day and time, how does a volunteer manage his or her time to answer calls, be a responsible family member, and hold down a job simultaneously. The, the volunteers are they they've been pulled and you know and running calls and all this and you know and then you add some more uh, fundraising and it, you know it just it, it tears on you. As the amount of calls increases, and with the up and the rescue squad, and and running the what we call the bells and smells, which you never did before. Uh, they, uh, it just takes more time. And, uh, the guy run the business, can't let his employee go fight fire. But still people have no idea how much it costs to actually do this business and it's all volunteer. So when people have to have that obligation, when they walk in the door and they fill out that application to come in here, the minimum of roughly about 200 hours, and that's just the beginning. That's just bare minimum for you to take a state exam then you have to continue your training. The time is coming when professional firefighters will have to cover when volunteers simply can't. A paid and volunteer, it's still professionalism, no matter what you do, no matter what your title is, whether you, you get a check or you don't. Um, like I said, it comes from right here. It comes from your heart. Uh, if you have the time to do this and the time that you can put in is well deserved. You know, there, there's a job for everybody. There's always something to do. It, you know, 
If you can't climb a ladder or you don't feel good climbing a ladder, you can pull a hose. Well, the volunteers care. They, they provide the greatest service because they care about the people that they're, they're, they're taking care of. And, you know, today it just seems like kids are excited about a video game. Well, how exciting is that? To me, excitement would be to crawl through a burning building and maybe save somebody or, or do CPR on somebody and see them walk down the street. That's exciting. April 1, 2016 marks the 100th anniversary of this organization. So yeah, I think that's kind of exciting that uh, uh, this is part of history and I'm looking forward to uh, keeping it going so that the next generation can come on and, uh, and keep it going. Oh wow, it's, it's very exciting, you know, to be, uh, uh, be a part of something that's been here that long and to see it still thriving well. Like I say, I'm, I'm just, I'm proud to, to be a member of this organization and people just trust me to do the job that I do. The next hundred years are virtually assured because the Gordonsville Volunteer Fire Company is more than an emergency service. It's a family, a social club, a brotherhood. A lot of us call it our fire company family. We're close, we, keep, we got each other's back, even, even our, our family we, with the auxiliary. We don't just fight fires and they do their thing, we do our thing. We all work together. Uh, raising money, whatever, whatever we're doing, it's it's almost like a brotherhood. If you've got a problem, you don't got you don't have to wear anything. If somebody in the fire company is going to be at your side to help you. It is a brotherhood. Once, uh, and that goes for anybody in the fire service. Uh, when you were in a burning structure and it was hot, and you couldn't see your hand in front of your face, and you knew he was with you, you felt comfortable because they were they were not going to leave you in there. Um, well from all different walks of life and different jobs and different educations and all. Uh, but when you're called on here, you volunteer here. And uh, you get your brothers back. And we have fun too, we have a whole lot of fun.